Welcome back. Britain's outgoing High Commissioner to Nigeria, Mr. Paul Arkwright, says he has been meeting with political candidates in Nigeria to discuss expectations for the 2019 general elections. In an interview with our correspondent, Amarachi Ubani, Mr. Arkwright advises the electorate to study the manifesto of each candidate and vote wisely. Hi, Commissioner Paul Arkwright. Thank you for speaking with us. It's uh, it's been uh, quite a task <laughs> trying to get this interview, uh, but I really appreciate your being here. So you've been in Nigeria three years, and you're gradually coming to the coast of your tenure. We're in the political era, of course, and uh, you know I'm going to ask you questions about our politics, which you have so closely observed. Right now, there are two main presidential candidates uh, belonging to the two main political parties in the country. Will you be having meetings with either of these candidates, uh, you know, before the general elections in 2019? Yes, I have regular contacts with both. I mean, that's part of my job as a High Commissioner here, um, as an international observer, as someone with a lot of interest in what's happening in, in Nigeria. Uh, my job is to keep in touch with people, to understand what's happening in the country, whether that's political or economic or cultural. Um, report back to London, obviously, on my perceptions of what's happening here. And with the elections so close, um, I'm really interested in what the candidates are saying about their programmes, about their policies, about how they want to drive Nigeria forward. Um, because we want to remain a partner with Nigeria, with whoever's the president. You know, we don't have a, we don't take a view, we're not supporting one candidate or another, we're not supporting one political party or another party. Um, we want to help Nigeria and Nigerians. And so understanding more about the programs which the two candidates have is a really important part of that, so that after the election, we, the UK, are ready to come in in strong support of whichever government it is. Um, that's what we've been doing for the last three years during my time here, and I'm sure that will continue uh, after the elections next year. You also monitored very closely the AKT state elections. You were in AKT. You know, you saw the whole process. Do you think it gave a sense of what to expect in 2019? Uh, I was pleased with the conduct of the elections in AKT, broadly speaking. But we were concerned about allegations of vote buying in AKT, uh, and, uh, or voter inducement, as it's sometimes called here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I called that out because, as far as I'm concerned, vote buying is just as illegal as ballot box stuffing, vote rigging, etc. Um, so I was at Akiti. I was not in Ocean, which is obviously the more recent one. Uh, and at Ocean, but at Ocean, we did have a team from the British High Commission. They were part of a wider international team of US, EU, other international observers. Civil society, of course, uh, was there in strength as well. Um, and it was more the reruns of the ocean elections where um, we, were, we were concerned about the conduct there. Um, we made a common statement, a joint statement with the EU uh, and the US, which you're probably familiar with, in which we expressed our concerns, in particular about security forces uh, interfering or intimidating uh, voters. So um, that was of concern. Um, I've raised that privately with the chairman of INEC, uh, along with my American and EU uh, colleagues. Um, he has assured us that uh, everything is in place, that he's maintaining that engagement relationship with the security forces. So we've expressed our concern about that. Um, it doesn't mean to say that that's a precursor for 2019, obviously. We really do hope that the elections go, uh, go forward smoothly, peacefully, and that the result is free and fair and credible. Apart from the two main presidential candidates, there are, all the, there are other presidential candidates of smaller parties, many of them, um, will they also get the opportunity to have that discussion with you? Uh, perhaps, you know, even though you know, their chances may not be so much during the elections, but will they also be meeting with you before February? I'm not just focused on the two main parties. Um, obviously, as I said, they probably have the biggest chance of one of them winning. Um, but it's also important that in a, in a democracy with a whole plurality, multitude of, uh, of parties that I, as the British High Commissioner, um, do see them as well. So there are time constraints. I don't think I'll be seeing absolutely every single candidate because there are a lot of them, uh, but absolutely ready to, to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. Well, you did mention vote buying, you know, alleged to vote buying, if I may put it that way. And then there's a lot that goes into preparing for elections. There's a lot of spending going on. I mean, millions of 
Naira will be spent between now and February. Do you think there should be a cap on how much politicians should spend on elections? Well, obviously I hear uh, the allegations uh, of, of vote buying. Um, I have condemned it. I will continue to condemn it. I know the INEC chair has condemned it. Uh, I know the political parties say they're against it. So, you know, and now it's time to sort of implement that and, and, and act on it. Yes, there seems to be a lot of money which is being spent on election preparation. My preference is that that money goes on uh, developing policies, on setting out manifestos, on reaching out to the voters to explain to them what the programme and the policies will be of the next government. Uh, for me, that's a good use of, of, of money as you approach an election. But do you think there is a level playing field for all of the parties, for all of the candidates during the elections? The bigger parties seem to have more chances at the elections. Well, I think it's about getting your message out. So you might not have a lot of money, but you can use social media uh, channels very, very effectively. Of course, Nigeria is a very well-developed social media uh, community. Uh, and I think people can use social media. You can get your messages out. Yes, of course, the big rallies, which is where you know, the, the, the main candidates will be, will be attending. But there are alternative routes to getting across a message about what policy, what programs you want to see put in place in Nigeria. So yes, some money is, is necessary, um, uh, but I don't think uh, it's, it's necessary to spend vast amounts of money unless you're, you know, and in, on, on inducing or whatever the allegations might be, when the important thing is to communicate your message to the voters. At, at the end of the day, this is a choice for Nigerians. And for uh, Nigerian voters, to have a, an idea of who they want to vote for or which party they want to vote for. You know, the parties have to convey the messages about what they're going to do to improve the lives of normal, you know, regular um, people in Nigeria, uh, poor people in Nigeria, people in the north, people in the south, across Nigeria. Um, and I think that's, that's really important, they get those messages across. And then people have a choice, but they need that choice to be informed. Finally on the programme, 2019 is looking bright for Palestine. It will not only chair the group of 77 developing nations in the UN, but it will also act more like a full member of the UN General Assembly, a move the United States and Australia disagree with. The voting... The 193-member United Nations General Assembly voted on Tuesday, October 16, to allow the Palestinians act more like a full UN member state during meetings in 2019, when they will chair the group of 77 developing nations. The United States, Israel and Australia voted against the move, which won 146 votes in favour. There were 15 abstentions and 29 countries didn't vote. We cannot support efforts by the Palestinians to enhance their status outside of direct negotiations. The United States does not recognize that there is a Palestinian state and notes that no such state has been admitted to as a UN member state. Therefore, we strongly oppose the Palestinians' election as chair of the G77, as well as this so-called enabling resolution. If this misguided resolution is adopted, the United States will leave no doubt about where we stand. The Palestinians want to establish a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. Israel captured those territories in the 1967 Middle East War and annexed East Jerusalem in a move not recognized internationally. The state of Palestine will spare no effort to prove worthy of this trust in its capacity to, re to represent and defend the interests of the group of 77 and China, while also engaging constructively and in an inclusive and transparent manner with all partners, I repeat, with all partners, in order to advance cooperation and mutually beneficial agreements for the common good of humanity. In 2012, the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly approved the de facto recognition of the sovereign state of Palestine when it upgraded the Palestinian Authority's UN observer status to non-member states like the Vatican from entity. 
The status upgrade has allowed them to participate in some General Assembly votes and join some international bodies. However, diplomats say as a non-member state, the Palestinians cannot speak in meetings until after member states. The Egyptian drafted resolution allows them to procedurally operate like a member state when acting on behalf of the G77 and China, making statements, submitting and co-sponsoring proposals and amendments, giving rights of reply and raising points of order. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. But do remember you can send your questions, comments and suggestions to any of the addresses showing on your screen. Thanks for watching. I'm Teniola Shobowale.